No, any thanks. Any changes or additions to the agenda? Yes, I would suggest adding a motion to approve Sweet. the budget proposal for fiscal year 2025. I'm fine. I'm fine. You hearing okay? For submission to the town of Amherst. Uh, okay, that's that's fine. Well, why don't we do that motion when we get to the budget committee? And uh, while I understand that no motion came from the budget committee, that would be an appropriate time, I think, to, to do it. Thank you, Bob. Okay, we have minutes from February. Can you hear now? February 12th. Uh, Tammy, you are unmuted on one device and muted on another. Okay, can you hear me now? You, We see you in two different boxes. So one one has your face and the other does we'll not talk to you goodbye okay so we have minutes to approve from february february 12th there's a motion to approve the minutes so moved is there a second second so before we approve the minutes i noticed that far has just joined as far as you just want to it's no, not a problem. Hi, just acknowledge I'm here. Person. Sorry. Not a problem. Nice to nice to see. You. Okay. There's a um, motion that has been seconded to approve the minutes of February 12th. Are there any corrections to those minutes? Okay. Right. Voting to approve the minutes. Bob. Yes. Tammy. Yes. Lee. Yes. Jean. Yes. Farah. <laughs> Yes. And Austin votes yes. Uh, we have uh, we have six attendees. Uh, we now have an opportunity for public comment. If any member of the public wishes to make a comment, if you would signify by raising your virtual hand. Okay. I see no no hands raised okay next item is the president's report and we're going to have a motion made let me just tell you that uh, we entered into following uh, your uh, instruction we entered into negotiation uh, with the amherst historical society uh, to secure easements uh, to facilitate the, the building project. Uh, we had productive meetings and conversations uh, with the historical society. Those meetings and conversations have produced the draft of the proposed uh, easement. You receive that along with a little map showing you where the easement would be in, in blue and in yellow. Uh, there are two easements. There's a temporary easement, which has to do with the uh, need for it during the construction project. There's a permanent easement having to do with the retaining wall. You also have seen a copy of a, of a draft memorandum of agreement between the town and the historical society. That's for your information. That does, does not involve us. Um, directly, though the execution of the easement is contingent uh, on that memorandum of, of agreement between the town and the historical society, um, you know, being signed. So that's where we are. What I'd like to do now is to have someone move uh, the that the, the board approve this um, easement. If that, that is seconded, I'm then going to ask um, a uh, parent to say a few words about the easement. So is there a motion to approve the the easement? So moved. Second. Okay. Bob, do you want to say a few words about the about the easement? Certainly. And I just um, to, to expand upon what you indicated, Austin, the reason that there are two separate documents is the library is a landowner is the party to execute into the easement. The entity that is is executing the project will be the town, and that's the reason for the memo of understanding between the town and the historical society. So that's why there are two separate related documents, but standalone documents, because different parties have different responsibilities under those agreements. Um, 
as as Austin indicated, uh, these have been reviewed. They were produced by the town attorney. They've been reviewed by the historical society. They had a couple of minor comments on them, um, but really no significant changes. And I think other than filling in some of the information regarding the exact meets and bounds, the legal description of the property and starting dates and ending dates, uh, these are ready to be executed. Uh, I wouldn't anticipate that the starting dates and ending dates get filled in until we receive bids, which are currently scheduled for April 16th. At that point, we'll have a bit more certainty regarding the timing and that information could be filled in and then the documents uh, should be ready for execution at that point. And Bob, just to be clear, those the 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 blanks in the document are what I do, would describe as ministerial or or logistical, right? They're not substantive. That's correct. It's the physical description of the property, which is agreed upon. It's been reviewed with the Historical Society now in graphic form. That is the figure that you received uh, that they have okayed. That gets transferred into legal language. And then, as I indicated, there are dates that need to be filled in, and I would expect to be filled in uh, over the next month. Great. Thanks. Okay. Uh, the floor is now open for discussion about the easement. Uh, any any questions or thoughts or observations? Uh, Bob, Bob Pam. Paragraph six requires us to provide liability insurance to the um, historical society <clears throat> in the amounts of a million and three million dollars. Uh, what is the cost of that? Is that already covered by the $22,000 in our upcoming budget, which uh, may or may not include that? And I'm just concerned about what the cost of that will be and whether we have covered that. Bob, do you want to say something about the insurance? Is that part of what will, um, uh, will be done when we sign contracts with a general contractor? Uh, yes, you're correct, Austin. That's the the construction contract requires the contractor to provide umbrella liability insurance. So that's provided, which will list the uh, uh, excuse me, will list both the library and the historical society as additional insured under those liability insurance policies. So that'll be provided for through the contract documents that are part of the town's responsibility. And that's actually referenced in the memo of understanding in the town agreement. So the easement agreement, which requires us to provide it to the historical society is in fact being covered by the uh, memorandum of agreement. Bob Parent. That is my understanding that the provision um, it's actually in the Memorandum of Understanding, I believe it's paragraph 2D right, that references the town will require the, hist the, the contractor to provide that liability insurance. Um, so it's a very similar requirement, and that's the vehicle by which that insurance will be provided for. So, Bob, just to be, um, just to be clear, uh, that paragraph refers to $5 million in insurance. The easement, uh, the easement number six that Bob was re referencing also uh, re adds up to $5 million in insurance, though it names three different figures, a million, three million, and one million. What you're telling us is that the insurance that's referenced in the easement is what is provided for in the memorandum of understanding. We will have no independent obligation to take out any other insurance. Is that correct? That's my understanding, but I can confirm that. Um, I will note that the, the actual contract requirements will exceed that 5 million that are called out. So Bob, it's my understanding though, Bob Perrin will confirm it, that uh, we don't have any independent obligation to take out insurance it'll be done through the um through the town and part of the um uh, what the general contractor will provide it would be nice to confirm this before we submit 
our budget proposal. And if it is not correct, then what are the adjustments that we will have to be made? Those are just questions that I have about that. Yeah, I think they're 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 right. They're very good questions. I hope we can vote to approve the easement uh, contingent upon the answer to that to that question. I don't want to postpone this vote on this easement. I understand. There are some minor language questions that I have about, about the easement as well. And um, there are references to fifteen thousand and one dollar. Yeah. Uh, as the amount to be provided as consideration um, on the last now therefore it simply says fifteen thousand dollars without the end one yeah um, so i don't know what the one is about and it, it is referenced obviously in the memorandum of agreement as well yeah bob do you know why the one dollar is there I believe the proposal that had been put forward had been a $15,000 payment and then a $1 uh, payment for the uh, permanent easement. So uh -huh. it's really just recognizing that there are actually two easements and two monetary components that when they add together come up, there needs to be a figure. There need needs to be some sum yep. written into the permanent easement and that, yep. that was put forward as $1. All right. So, so the, go ahead, Bob. So then, the writing of the the amount in words at the now therefore on page one needs to add the word and one. Correct. Agree. And on page two, under temporary oh, oh, easement. Oh, oh. Hold on one sec. I just want to take these one at a time, if it's okay. Sure. So, uh, the what we're going to do is we're going to I hope vote to approve with these changes, right? So that's one of them. Bob, go ahead. Okay. Um, paragraph two on page two, temporary easement. <clears throat> uh, the second from the last line, uh, evidencing termination of the rights granted pursuant to which section? I think that's to this section. Uh, it says, it's a Two lines from the bottom of number two, it says evidencing termination of rights granted pursuant to which section should be this section. I yep. believe so, but you should read it and just yep. no, I read it. More. Okay. In paragraph three, the fourth line from the bottom. Um, again, this is just uh, nitpicking but uh, after the parenthesis collectively with grantee the grantee parties yep. remove all its equipment and i would think it's remove all of its equipment i i think we can leave it the way it is right remove its equipment right. i think it grammatically does the same work more or less <laughs> uh, and finally in the uh, notary statement. Where the Amherst Historical Society, who proved to me through satisfactory evidence of identification of satisfactory evidence of identification, the re repetition of that phrase does not make any sense. Yeah, Bob, again, I just let so we're down at the end. Um, in the notary statement. Correct. Um, this is, uh, this are, is for the Amherst Historical Society. Yeah, I see it. What, what is the repetition? Satisfactory evidence of identification of satisfactory ev evidence of identification. Yeah, repeated twice. Prove to me through satisfactory evidence of it. Yeah, okay. The same is true for the second notary for yeah. us. Yep. So that just needs to be the, the second of satisfactory evidence uh, of identification just needs to be deleted from both of those. And finally, for the Jones Library, um, I, believe, I believe it asks for two signatures. In, at least in general, it does. Um, but where it has um, a notary statement, 
there is only room for one signature for Jones. Let me undersign on this day before me the undersigned notary. Appeared Austin, comma, president. president. And then it should be a second line for Robert Pham, treasurer. There is a comma there. But I believe that's for your title. I don't know. Is it Bob? Um, what I've typically done is that this uh, page gets reproduced such that there's a separate page for each notary attestation. So is it, uh, I thought the comma was for two names, but is it uh, for the titles rather than the, the name? I do believe it's titles. Um, okay. Okay. And as I said, I think typically there are two separate statements that get produced and they get notarized twice um, individually. Okay. Bob, okay. Do, you have, do you have any other questions? Nope, that's it. Okay, and uh, Bob Parent, you've noted the things that Bob has re uh, referenced. Yes, I have. And I will get a confirmation regarding the um, construction insurance, li liability insurance, carrying uh, forward to meeting the requirements yeah. of the easement agreement. Right. Okay. The difficulty is I hear double. Tammy, we can hear you. So if you want to mute your other one as well. Uh, okay. <sighs> You're on through two different devices, so. I can't. Just know that you're. Just know that anything you say is coming through. So just be. You've, okay, you've now muted the other device. Good. Okay. Other uh, thoughts or questions about the easement. And remember, as Bob said, we're talking about two: the temporary easement and the permanent easement, both of which are referenced in the, um, in the document. So we have a motion. We'll approve. To vote to approve this easement with the changes that we've noted and contingent upon information uh, concerning the uh, insurance coverage. Namely, we're approving it if the representation that the insurance coverage referenced in the memorandum of agreement with the town, in fact, is the insurance coverage referenced in the easement. If that turns out not to be true, we may have to come back uh, and revisit this um, revisit this discussion. Okay, voting to approve the easement with the uh, Amherst Historical Society. Bob Pam. Yes. Lee? Yes. Jean? Yes. Farah? Yes. Tammy? Yes. And Austin votes yes. And I just want to say um, how grateful we are to have such good neighbors, um, how grateful we are to have a kind of working relationship with the historical society that we um, that we have. Uh, working with them has been um, a pleasure as it always is. Uh, and I think we've come to an understanding that serves the interests, not only of the building project, but also um, of the historical society. Okay. Next item is the building committee. Well, the building committee again has not uh, has not met. I um, imagine that we will meet again um, after the um, the bids are in and after we have a general um, general uh, contractor. Sharon, do you want to say anything about the interim spaces? Uh, I, all I can say is that, um, we're, what can I say? What can I say, Bob Parent? Um, we're working on it and we're so close and people will be happy. Does that, is that, how's that? Bob Parent, do you want to add to that? I don't think it gets any better than that. So I'll <laughs> leave it at that. So, Sharon, do you have a sense of when there may be more to say about the interim spaces? Uh, you, you may not. Do you have a sense of when? No, not okay. really. A couple of weeks. 
but I said that a couple of weeks ago, so it's hard to say. Okay, any questions about the building committee and the building project? Two questions. Uh, Bob, hold on one second. I've got Far first. Far. Sharon, uh, just a quick question. So I'm sure like everything is up in like for the staff. So how's everyone dealing with this? Not knowing exactly how much to pack and exactly when you're going to move. So we, we don't moving out of boxes or no. So so we don't know timing yet, but we know what we have to do. So staff are working on uh the plans for when we do close and get to start packing and and we'll be moving and the, the pr is a big piece you know getting information out to the public that's really important so staff are working on that um <clears throat> so it's really for them it's more about the timing and of course that's definitely a little anxiety producing um you know the summer reading program is going to be here before we know it and staff normally are are very involved in that planning right about now and that's hard to do because there's so much planning that has to be done regarding the move um that's okay. yeah that okay well we appreciate all that you're doing and they're doing the staff really are, they're pretty fabulous. You know, so as I, I said, kind of jokingly, four years ago when COVID happened, they turned on a dime and they completely reworked, re-envisioned, re-imagined, and started providing library services in a different way. And and they're kind of having to do that again, but this time, you know, no one's afraid to be near each other. So um, they they got this. They got this. That's Thank great. you for asking, Farah. Thank you. I'm a little disappointed that Sharon didn't reference um, an appearance by the president of the Board of Trustees um, to express our appreciation to the to the staff and to lift their morale. Um, appreciation was conveyed. I'm not sure how morale, how well morale was lifted, but I did. I did. Go, go to the library to talk to them a little bit about how much we appreciated what they were going to be doing in this period of transition. Um, and I think Sharon has done a great job in terms of um, enlisting, uh, enlisting their cooperation and their taking on, if you will, this extra, this extra work. Bob, 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 Pam. Two questions. Um, first is uh, since since the library is essentially still fully functioning in its current location, um, and it, at some point the the construction plan basically says once a contract is signed, it moves immediately into construction, work on the building. Just how long is it going to take to actually pack up, move, and unpack? in order to allow for the construction to begin. So that's and the first question. Bob, Bob Parent can talk more about uh, the timing that exists between each um, milestone. Uh, but staff are looking at, right now they're, they're thinking about once we know, you know, when we're moving, that we're moving, where we're moving, um, we could close and then we would need about four weeks and then we would move over to the new space and then it would take us about another four weeks uh, before we could open. Those are all issues. Um, really no date that I throw out there right now can, can mean much of anything because there are so many unknowns and so many moving parts and things that I thought I knew last week have changed already. Um, and so everybody's just going to have to bear with the whole process. We'll know more okay. when bids open on the 16th. So does Bob Parent recognize that there is a four week hiatus between approving a contract and actually 
starting to do any work within this building? That's the question. Absolutely. And as Sharon indicated, I can talk just a little bit about what the contracting, contract, contract award, um, contract execution timeline looks like. Um, by statute, uh, communities have up to 30 days, excluding weekends and holidays between the time when they receive bids to award the bids. That time period is typically used to check references, resolve any issues that might come up um, in a you know in a bid or a bid protest or anything else that might come up. Knock on wood. Let's hope we don't get there. But you know things do happen. So there's a 30 day clock minus holidays and weekends that's running once the bids are received. The next step after the contract is awarded is the actual contract execution. And that typically takes a couple of weeks because what happens in that time period is the contractor has to reach out to the bonding company to get their bonds in place. They have to reach out to their insurance co company to get their insurance certificates in place. The town has to review those documents, make certain they comply with the contract documents. That's typically a couple of week period unto itself. And then there's typically a, a, a time lag between when the contract gets executed and a notice to proceed gets issued. And the notice to pre proceed is the actual document that says, you know, you have, you've won the contract, we've executed the contract, and now you're free and clear to proceed on the project. Um, that will probably be about a two-month period from start to finish between when the bids get received to when the actual notice to proceed date is. And that overlays pretty well with the whole, you know, library moving process. Um, so it's something we're constantly looking at. Sharon and I are talking about almost every day of how do those two work together. But I do think they'll work together okay. Thanks, Bob. Bob Pam, does that answer your question? Yeah. So it sounds like groundbreaking would be middle to late June or early July. That's likely, you know, June is probably the earliest. Um, then it's up to the contractor to decide what their schedule is going to be. You know, we set the completion date. We don't set their start date. Okay. And that meets the requirements of the MBLC. The MBLC only requires that we sign a contract with a GC by the end of June. Okay. okay. I had one other question for sure. the, with respect to the building committee. Uh, and that is, uh, <clears throat> once uh, it was discovered that, that we had to take down ceilings in order to remove uh, <clears throat> dangerous materials below the roof, um, that changed the question which had previously been stated, which is that we could not put additional insulation in the old parts of the building um, because that would involve getting behind walls which did not have um, a space. And I don't know whether any of the, the ceilings being taken down is going to change that ability to get insulation into the old parts of the building. Karen, what's, uh, what is FAA's view of this? I haven't asked specifically, so I don't know. We'll find out for you, Bob. Thank you. Okay, any other questions about the building committee? Uh, the building committee is being re reconstituted. Uh, we have to change the membership, adding a member from the board of trustees, adding a public member. Uh, and again, that is, uh, that, is, that is being done. Okay, buildings and facilities. Clara? Uh, <clears throat> nothing to report. We haven't met yet this year. Um, Sharon, I guess we'll be meeting next month, maybe, if we have something to meet about. Sharon? Ish. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it kind of, it goes back to the whole conversation uh, that we, ju we just had. It's all wrapped up together. Thank you, for. Okay, next is the Development Committee, Lee Edwards. <laughs> Okay, uh, you have the relevant documents for the uh, annual fund as of March 1st. March 1st seems su suddenly so long ago, I can hardly yeah. remember it. Uh, 
The annual fund has contributions of $90,786 from 496 gifts uh, as compared with $85,752 from 522 gifts at the same time a year ago. So uh, the, the, this year's trend is continuing that we're a little bit ahead of where we were last year. We have fewer gifts, but on average, the gifts are higher. And we are constantly tracking people who gave last year who haven't given this year in the hopes of getting at least a match, if not an increase in the number of gifts. We don't want to lose donors to the annual fund. And we keep trying to explain in our mailings, the annual fund goes for programming chiefly and the and other funds go to the capital campaign so and that the library needs contributions in both and for the capital campaign uh it was a slow month the month of february glad it's over glad that it was short and march has been quite a lot more active uh there's a there's at least $50,000 that I know of in pledges and contributions for March. And in addition to which, there's almost my favorite gift to the entire capital campaign. It's not a huge gift, but it's a gift from a local poker club, which has pooled its winnings for the past year in order to make a contribution to the capital campaign. So I think that's quite lovely. And uh, the, an ongoing series of uh, library tours, chiefly given by Kent and or me, uh, which has been very robust. And for each of the last two tours that we have given, we've each had 16 people, which is enormous. Uh, um, so, you know, we, we know they were very enthusiastic and we will follow up with them. So the beat goes on. Great. Lee, may I just ask you a question? Um, in the chart, the, the page that says capital community campaign results today, uh, yeah. March 1st report, current, and then last report, is that February 1st, 2024? It was just cut off on the document. Oh. I, I I think so, yeah. But so uh, my I'm, question is simply: uh, I just want clarification. Um, if you to just take a look, this is just completely minor. Towards the bottom, where we're talking about gifts of uh, under hundred and around hundred dollars, they're listed one hundred and thirty-five of them in February mm -hmm. for a total of four thousand six hundred and thirty-two. And then 135, the number hasn't changed, but the dollar amount has changed. And I, that's true in um, in a couple of places. Uh, there are, hmm. uh, uh, the numbers are just hard for me to follow. There are 102 gifts listed of $100 or more in February, but then only 100 in March. Yes, yes, see what you say. I'll have to ask. Uh, the person who generated these for some explanation. It's, I, I don't, uh, rather than speculate, I'll just ask and get an yeah, answer. And no, nothing nothing yeah. of great significance. Yeah. I just noticed those numbers and couldn't figure yeah. out. You know, one of the things that's constantly happening is people are people are often changing their pledges. Uh -huh. And so they may go from a less than 100 up to a 100 or a 500, et, et cetera. So this is literally a snapshot as of March 1st. On March 2nd, the report is going to look differently. Um, that would have been my speculation, but I thought I would ask. Sorry. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's, it's, but... Again, it would be good to know. The numbers yep. just it's hard to follow. Yep. Okay. Any questions uh, for the development committee? Yes. Robert. Um. The March 1 report describes the amount in gift intentions 
as $1.8 million, <clears throat> while the amount of gifts has increased to $2.2 million. That is all good news, but I have thought that it would be useful to have a column which basically looks at the translation of intentions into actual cash um, as an additional column. For example, uh, between February 1 and March 1, basically $252,000 was converted from, or at least I think it's converted from intentions into actual gifts. I can speculate and say that is probably the contribution that was made by Amherst College. Um, but, you know, it is useful to be able to, to track the amount of intentions which are being converted into actual cash. So I uh, would like to, to have this report reflect, you know, some, some translation uh, column, which basically says conversions to cash or something of that kind. Um, because it is, it is nice to know that the intentions actually get carried out, but it's also helpful to know what it is that is happening in these, in these reports. There is a second, I'll, I'll hold on the rest. So one of the things that I would say is gifts doesn't necessarily mean that they were pledges to begin with. These could be new gifts. I, I yeah. totally appreciate those... what, what people are asking for. If you want exact, again, it comes down to a snapshot. This was what it was as of March 1st. On March 2nd, it changed. We can't give out you know, names and addresses, and this is how much each person has has donated and whether or not there was a pledge. There's also a happy medium between getting the work done and, and reporting on it. And it it's not, it seems like it's so simple to be able to say, oh, Sharon, Sherry used to be a pledge and now she's a gift. And so there's add one. Um, but but it, I just want people to understand it's a bigger beast than that. And, and yeah, but we have, we have asked the, the folks who use the, the software to do the reporting, you know, it has to get, it gets reported out of the software and then it gets transferred into this PDF and it's a process. So anyways, Leah, I don't know if you have other things to say. No, I was going to say, I mean, pretty much what Sharon said is, is, is true. If the trustees feel that it would be helpful for us to have each month a number that says, this is the amount that was previously pledged that has now come in. I think that that could be generated without that much difficulty. But just to underline what Sharon has said, that will tell you exactly what we said. It won't map on any other number in the in the table. You won't be able to extrapolate from that back to what the total gifts were. It'll just say of whatever we're mapping, this is this much came in at pledge fulfillment. Bob, before you say anything more on this, I just want to ask a question. So I there's a kind of question behind I hear another question or a question that's and that is, are you encountering difficulties in converting pledges into gifts? Are you asking me? Yeah. No, no, no right. contraire. Right. So that's that's kind of the question that one would be worried about, right? If the Capital Campaign Committee said, we're actually having trouble moving pledges into gifts, people are pledging and then not fulfilling their pledges. But you're not you're not having that problem. No. Okay, Bob. And I'd be happy to, to discover that the amount that is being pledged is increasing faster than the amount that's being withdrawn. I, yeah, that that that's fine too. Um, I'm just trying to have a better handle on this, and I think maybe what I need to do is to um, go visit with the friends who are doing this and get a better understanding of how it works. 
So again, I, you're 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 welcome to do that insofar as the friends want to provide that information. But I think what you are asking is whether the trustees want this information. That was and, what I was asking. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that that's the issue. The issue isn't whether any one of us wants it. That would be that's fine. But this is a decision that the board has to make to request this n new bit of information. Uh, so uh, I I think, I don't know, you'd have to make a motion and then we'd have to have, discuss the motion and have to prove the motion and then ask the uh, the capital campaign to committee to do it. If you don't want the board to, to, to ask for it, that's fine. Um, the memorandum of under, of agreement I'm sorry, I don't remember which it is, uh, with the friends basically says that, you know, the treasurer can and should be reviewing things. And so that is what I've been doing. Well, the treasurer can and should, I, I totally appreciate that, but we're going to look at the bylaws in a minute. And the bylaws are very clear that uh, we don't act as individuals. We act as, we act as a board. So uh, I, I think maybe what you ought to do is to engage in further conversations with the capital campaign. And uh, and then if there is a desire for additional information, that desire can uh, be brought to the board and the board can ask for it as a board. OK, any other question for the development committee? All right, thank you for the work that the development committee is doing. Thank you as always to the uh, to the capital campaign committee. Okay, Tammy, PPP, talking about the bylaws, yep. Okay, we have two um, motions. The first is to approve a, the revision of the bylaws. And this was fairly um, limited getting rid of the select board and uh, making a few similar changes. So I move that we accept the revised bylaws and list of committee assignments in town committee. Is there a second? Second. Okay. So uh, questions about uh, the revisions to the bylaws, which are mostly grammatical in one place, it, rightly corrects the reference to the select board. Okay, so voting to approve the revision of the bylaws, Bob Pam. Yes. Lee Edwards. Yes. Gene. Yes. Barra. Yes. Tammy. Yes. And Austin votes yes. Okay, um, Tammy. There's a second motion and Sharon, will um, Catherine Whitcomb be able to join us? Yes, she happens to be in the audience, although I didn't ask her to speak to this, um, but knowing her, she's absolutely prepared. Okay. Well, I, I will make a motion that we approve the deaccession list um, provided by um, the uh, director of special collections and to transfer items to the American Historic Society. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Catherine, welcome to the meeting. Thank you for, thank you for coming. Thank you for joining us. Do you want to say uh, anything about um, the list. Thank you for the memo, and the and and the list. You want to say anything explaining uh, what is being deaccessioned? Of course. Um, uh, can everyone hear me now? Yes. Okay. Good. Excellent. This is the second of hope and hopefully the last request um, for items to be deaccessioned from the number of items that were transferred to us by the Amherst Historical Society back in April of 2022. At that point, they did a very large um, tra um, transition of items to us. 
Uh, I came before the board in November of 2022 with my first request. It was about 75 books, I believe. And then this request is the result of my colleagues' um, excellent efforts at going through the remaining or the remainder of that collection being um, transferred. She actually went through it twice to double check. And so the items on this list, the 228 lines represent items that do not, we do not believe fall within the collection development policy of special collections. And so we ask the trustees that they be allowed to be deaccessioned and returned to the Amherst Historical Society as laid out in the original deed of gift back in, that was signed back in April of 2022. Thank you, Catherine. Catherine, I have a question that I didn't, um, I, I guess, what does it mean to say no connection, um, no direct connection to Amherst? So I'm, I was, I, my eye was struck by a proposed to deaccessioning an issue of the Springfield Republican from 1861. And the explanation given said no direct connection to Amherst. And I wonder what that means or how that judgment is made. Basically, what we do, what specifically Jennifer did, and then uh, we work together on several of them, yep. basically through and Every single item, we looked at the item, tried to find any information that the historical society had about the item, yeah. um, which oftentimes didn't really happen. And then we looked at each item specifically and said, okay, is there a direct connection to Amherst in this item? If it's a newspaper, is it, is it about, does it have an Amherst article in it? I does see. it have an Amherst picture in it? Yeah, I see. Um, th things like that. If it was simply that it's a Springfield newspaper. We don't actively collect Springfield newspapers. Um, right. We have a very small collection of very early ones, but we simply don't have the room and Springfield collects them for us. So if we ever need them, we can contact Springfield. Okay, so you're assessing, you're actually looking at the newspaper and saying, is there something in it that references Amherst? That's very helpful to know. Okay. Yes, we, yes, we do go that, um, we do go that deep in our determination Right. Of is it is it worth keeping? Yes. Is it worth us keeping or should it be returned? Yes. Right. Okay. Questions about the deaccessioning proposal or about any of the items. Okay. Voting to approve the deaccessioning request. Bob Pam. Yes. Lee. Lee said signal yes. Jean? Yes. Laura? Yes. Tammy? Yes. And Austin votes yes. With great thanks, Catherine, for the work that you did. This is a considerable bit of labor. So thank you very much for that. I'd like to thank Catherine because during our PPP meeting, she went over this list in great detail. So she was terrific. And I want to thank her for her assistance. Oh, I have to thank my colleague, Jennifer. She did a lot of the legwork on this one. So, yes. Great. Tammy, anything else from PPP? No, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next um, is a report from the Budget Committee. Um, um, I guess I would propose a motion to approve the budget proposal for fiscal year 2025 for submission to the town of Amherst. Is there a second? A second. Okay. Bob, do you want to say anything? Yes. Okay. The budget committee discussed the proposal prepared by the director uh, and was split on it. So it comes to the board without a recommendation. Uh -huh. I believe okay. we need to discuss it. It must be submitted to the town by April 1st. Right. I can make my comments, but I think Sharon should talk first about what it is that she has prepared. Sharon? Sure. Um, so what I've submitted is a, uh, a decrease in 0.1 by 0.1% 
over FY24, uh, a total budget of $2,934,762. Um, as uh, because there are still a lot of unknowns specifically where we're going to be yeah. um, for next fiscal year. And utilities are a big uh, are the big thing that's up in the air. It's it, it has to do with the number of places that we're going to have to go in the interim, as well as what we'll have to pay as far as electricity or um uh -huh. or, or or gas or whatever that is. So so what I have included here are conservative um educated guesses uh based on some estimates that we got from um some people who are leasing from the space that's there okay. now. Um there there are a lot of there are a lot these are these are a lot of placeholders. And so what the conversation came down to was I've included $23,000 worth of programming. Uh, and, and what was also proposed is boosting that number up to $40,000, in which case that difference would have to be added under revenue sources to uh, what, what we would request from the friends. Um, and so the reason I, I, I wasn't comfortable adding to the bottom line, not because I, I don't think the friends will raise it. I'm worried about what staff will be able to accomplish and what kind of funds I will need for utilities. And, and so, um, if, if we end up having to spend less in utilities, yay, then whatever extra money comes in that would go towards programming. Um, but if it didn't, I, um, I, I didn't want to over promise programming to people. So that's why I'm recommending what's in the packet. Yeah. Um, and, and so Bob, I'll throw it back over to you. Uh, Bob, before, before you, uh, may I just ask a couple of questions about what Sharon just said? So you've reduced the utility in the budget proposal, the utilities expenses is $60,000. Is that right? Am I reading it correctly? Yeah. And that is a substantial reduction from what the budget was for 2024 of 30 some odd thousand dollars. Correct. And that, that decrease is being driven by your sense of what the utility costs will be in an interim space. Yes. Yeah, so one of the locations that we're looking at, we won't have to pay certain utilities that we have to pay now. Mean, me, meaning I've understood it correctly that the reduction in utilities is driven by your sense of what the utility costs will be in this interim location where we're going to be when this budget year is in, um, in place. Correct. Similarly, with respect to programming, there is a substantial reduction in the budget for programming. And I, I wanted to understand that. Uh, and again, I imagined it had been to do with the interim location that you are not sure what the programming possibilities will be given the other responsibilities that the staff are going to have to take on during the time that we are in the interim location. Is that correct? That That's a part of it. The other part is uh, looks are deceiving. So for the FY24 budget yeah. for programming, that $71,000 figure, yeah. that includes uh, a large chunk of money for Lynn's uh, ESL class of senior citizen, for seniors. Um, that is only going to go on for half of FY25. So it looks like the decrease is quite large but it's not. Well, um, the, other thing, the other thing I wanted to just make sure I understood is actually the proposal for FY25 looks a lot like the actual in programming for FY20, 21, and 22. Correct. So yeah. it, it's, it's not in and of itself an unprecedented figure. Right. 
uh, because you go back to those three years and one year it was 26 and one year it was 25 and one year it was 29. So it's within that frame. Correct. Okay. Sorry, uh, Bob, Bob Pam. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to do this somewhat formally just because that's the way I put it through. But this is a budget for a period in which we expect to be outside the Jones building with unclear access to our collection. I'm sorry, but I have to do this. There's many other sections. I will go just ask the librarian. As a trustee, and I'm having a meeting at the board, so I'm afraid I have to do this right now. This right here, right now. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to continue if I could. Sure. This is a budget for a period in which we expect to be outside the Jones building with unclear access to our collection and possibly awkward access to many staff services. For some patrons, it will feel like the Jones is partially closed. Like closing the schools during COVID, it could result uh, <clears throat> in negative impacts on our patrons and potential patrons. To counter such an impression, I think we need to find ways to come out to meet patrons wherever they may be, meaning new and broader forms of programming. Yeah. Okay. Can, um, yeah, I'm really sorry, but this is the only place I'm forced to quiet, so. That's fine. Can I find you another spot? Please do. Okay. Um, Austin, it will take me a moment to move to a different location. Take, 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 take your time, Bob, and stop being so disruptive in the library. I will try to avoid it in the future. <laughs> Thanks, Bob. Take your time. Oh. Uh, so we'll just take a minute while Bob is relocating. It's good to know he's using the library. We like the library, as you may know. Yeah, I don't see like the tree, Yes. Red London? Oh, yeah. Would you like me to give you a tour of the library? Sure. Go show that there's great demand on library space. It is true. And I should not have done what I did, but it was empty when I arrived. <laughs> okay. uh, Can you hear me? Yeah, back to you, Bob. Okay, I'm going to make this just a little louder if that helps. If you don't need it, I won't. We're good, we can hear you. Okay. <clears throat> this is a budget for a period in which we expect to be outside of the Jones building with unclear access to our collection and possibly awkward access to many staff services. For many patrons, it will feel like the Jones is partially closed. Like closing the schools during COVID, it could result in negative impacts on our patrons and potential patrons. To counter such an impression, I think we need to find ways to come out to meet patrons wherever they may be, meaning new and broader forms of programming. In broad strokes, the total 2025 income and expense projected are about the same as this year. <clears throat> the town appropriation is set to rise by 4% rather than the more usual 3%, but half of that is swallowed by a $47,000 increase in benefits. Direct salaries and work study rise by $75,000. So other changes are needed to cut costs or raise income. Anticipating we will be out of the Jones, maintenance, repairs, and utilities are reduced by nearly $100,000 while operations are set to rise by 16,000. With other smaller changes, the total expenses are just $4,000 less than this year's budget. 
fiscal year 25 income from the town is about $90,000 higher than this year. The endowment draw is just $3,000 higher than this year. These sources are, and that's by our formula. Yeah. Um, these sources are supplemented by state aid grants and funds of the Friends of the Jones. Last year, we projected higher income from the Friends than they raised, which we made up for by using virtually all of the state aid's prior unspent balances. This year, state aid will be higher, but all of it is included in the budget. The line for gifts and grants is lower, in part because there is less grant money receivable, but also because the amount expected from the Friends has now been reduced to less than we received last year and can expect this year. Included in our package is a 2025 proposal to spend $23,700 on programming. However, 15,200 of that is ESL, leaving just $8,500 for activities in three or more locations for kids, young adults, and adults. It's just less than $9,000. To be clear, this is consistent with current library policy. Also in our packet is a request to the Friends for money for adult programming for the three remaining months of fiscal year 2024 for $500. Three months, $500, all adult programs. Part of the expansion we plan is the, to expand the kinds of services we can offer. This is the time to experiment with new formats, partners, and communications to make our neighbors, whether they're physical or virtual, excited by the project and supportive of it. A budget is a plan of action, a statement of what areas we want to emphasize and how we want to achieve results. I don't believe that as written, this budget does that in a way that is strategic and effective. Make the library more lively, and I believe we can raise more money for both the capital campaign and the annual fund. This is when we need to build support for the capital campaign, both in its large donor component, but also by strengthening the local endorsement to be evidenced by more small donor receipts. I believe people will respond to a visible library that sponsors and carries out community events, sometimes online, but also through films, participatory physical programs like dance or games, lectures and demonstrations, and not always within the Jones spaces. Therefore, I recommend that we add at least $25,000 to the programming line to be balanced by an increase in the gifts and grants line with the understanding that if this proves insufficient, that we request the friends to make an additional contribu contribution from the Woodbury Fund if needed. I would also question whether we can effectively use work-study students at the current level if the likely demand for browse books is reduced because you can't browse our collection. Subsequent to the preparation of the proposed budget, okay, I'll, I've already dealt with the other part of this. So that is my comment on the budget. I think we need to have more than $8,500 for uh, programming um, and plus the ESL programs. And this is inadequate. It is simply the wrong message to send to the town of Amherst. So Bob, I'm gonna ask you to hold off on making a motion, at least for a minute, if that's okay. Okay. Uh, so I wonder, I wonder, Sharon, if you could uh, give us your sense of what your, your, your sense of what Bob has just said. Uh, <laughs> um. So my question is, um, when we are in our interim location, how do you imagine or what do you imagine in terms of the availability of staff time for 
doing the kinds of programming that might have otherwise been done if we were in not in an interim location. I I know that staff uh, staff love programming. They um, that's like the heart and joy and soul of of what they do here. They understand that. Um, that's one of the big things that bring people to the library. So that's absolutely what they want to do. Um, but at this point, it's really hard to be out of survival mode. Uh, we're all kind of in survival mode right now. And that's, it's, we're going to be in survival mode for several months. Um, combine that with, you know, year after year after year with Bob saying we're expecting too much from the friends. Um, uh, I, so if money were no object, absolutely. I would want nothing but programming, but, um, there, there is no programming space in the interim spaces. So all of the, um, all the programming will be off site, which means it, it's more difficult to do that because I do have to, we have to staff the interim space and I'm not all of a sudden going to be doubling my staff. So that's a, that's a piece of that survival mechanism. People also need to be able to get sick, um, you know, go on vacation, that kind of a thing. So this is, I'm, I'm getting into the weeds, but it's running a library out of several locations is not an easy feat. And I need to protect the staff and, and their sanity and their health. Um, and so the budget I submitted takes that into consideration along with I'm, I need to pay utilities. That, that's, that's a no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, and so if there ends up being money and time and staffing at the end of the day, I have a feeling that a year from now I will come back to you and the FY24 actuals and the FY25 actuals will be better, you know, than what I'm predicting right now. I'm just, I, I'm just feeling like it's important to be on the conservative side. Uh, that being said, look at my glasses. I'm happy to take risks. So if you all want to add another 25 G's to what the friends have to raise, Sure, we can throw that in there. Um, I'm just, I'm not comfortable doing that right now. Or... Um, so when Bob was reading his statement, I was, and just based on what Sharon just said, I was just wondering how realistic Bob's expectations are. Um, thinking about what Sharon said about staff being in, in um, you know, almost in COVID mode, I realize the space is going to be smaller. I know the staff go above and beyond always like they did during COVID as well. But I, I don't, I, I like, I like the, I, I like the fact that Bob wants us to continue to do, wants the library to continue to do all this and, and send the message that this is what we want donations for. We want people to um, to support this, but I just don't see it as realistic. And I just feel like with a smaller space and staff like jumping around, I feel like also I'm, a lot of the programming, uh, what I was presuming Sharon was uh, some of the programming might shift to Munson or the North Amherst library. And I just feel like that's a lot to ask of people. And you spoke about the schools, I believe, Bob. And I'm thinking like during the construction phase right now, I think things are going to be very different. I mean, we have certain expectations that things will go on as they should, but I feel there's going to be a lot, lot of disruption at the Fort River site right now with the with the construction going on. And I just... And just to bring that back to the Jones, I think it's, especially this first year, it's a lot to expect from the staff and from the library. And I and I think I respect that Sharon knows what she's talking about. She's been doing this forever. She's worked with the staff during COVID. And I just, I, I would respect 
what Sharon has to say about this. I mean, I I I like that it's what you're saying to me is very idealistic, but I don't see that maybe next year things would be different. But right now I feel like so much is up in the air that I think that's a lot to expect from the library and the staff. Thanks. Thank you, Laura. Lee? Would you well, like me to speak? No, okay. okay, it's Lee. Bob, I'd like just to let some others get in for a minute. Absolutely. Thank you. I'll get back to you, Lee. Uh, thank you. Uh, I appreciate what Dara had to say. I think the main reason that the budget committee came to you without having made a recommendation prior to this meeting was precisely so that the whole board of trustees could have this very important discussion. I did not think it was something that should just stay within a two person committee. Um, and then I know it, <laughs> this is going to sound very odd to people who are professional budget readers, but I regard the budget especially this year, as truly a projected document in a year in which there is so much uncertainty. And I know from having worked with Sharon and from having worked with many of you all on um, the trustees, that um, the library needs to have a certain amount of flexibility as it moves through on certain times, which for as long as I've been a trustee, that all the times have been uncertain. And so um, if Sharon wanted to come back in the middle of the year to the trustees or to the friends to say, we made a budget based on certain assumptions, these assumptions have worked out in such a way that I am now coming to you with revised assumptions that require re changing the budget projection and changing the request to the friends or to the trustees for the endowment, um, that we would have a discussion that was sensible and try to resolve whatever the issues were. So that's sort of this, you know, I, 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 my, my own feeling is along the lines that Farah said, I would tend to trust Sharon's projection with the understanding that it's a fluid situation and if and when things change, she'll get back to us and we will accommodate those changes. Thank you, Lee. Thank you. I got Bob and then Tammy, Bob. Um, last year, we made some assumptions about when we would be moving forward on the construction of this project. At the time, um, the budget included an estimate of $175,000 to be raised by the friends. Yeah, um, that will be off by at least fifty thousand dollars this year, uh, which will be made up by taking what was left of our state aid reserves. Yeah, um, the year before we set it up at one hundred and seventy-five thousand dollars. The description was that this was to be um, a a proposal based on what we hope would happen. And so um, in both cases, I voted for a budget that I thought was unrealistic, but which you know I was willing to allow uh, because I could not produce a real budget in a year in which we expected to be uh, in the middle of crazy moves. Here we are expecting that by July 1, give or take a few days, um, we will be out of this building and we will be uh, in a comparatively stable situation. Uh, that comparatively stable situation ought to be um, seen by us as an opportunity to uh, work on things that need to be worked on. Um, Sharon is correct that this is not a drastic change from last year because we didn't do enough programming this year. And we didn't do enough programming the year before. Um, you know, that it has been my position all the way through. But, you know, to have a, a, a real budget at this point of $8,500 for all children, adult, and young adult programs is ridiculous. 
Uh, it is a way of saying that we really are not going to be a presence in the town of Amherst for this year. And my guess is that the same arguments will be made for the second year in which we will be out of this building and waiting for a new building to go. This is not the way for us to maintain a presence that we need to do. It is not the way for us to raise money. It is not the way for the library to function. And I will object to this in every way that I know how. I, this is this is this is a way of us making sure that we do not have a successful capital campaign at the local level. It's a way of making sure that uh, dissatisfaction with the Jones Library will continue and grow. And I don't want that to happen. Bob, okay, Tammy, you're next. Um, I think the staff is pretty beloved by the community and, as Sharon said, enjoy doing the programming. I think they will do everything in their um, power to offer as many programs as they can. Um, and I, I would like to trust them and trust um, the director's assessment of uh, how funds might need to be appropriated with the knowledge that things can be shifted if utility costs aren't as as she has suggested. Um, I'd like to clarify, Sharon, is this correct that out of the programming budget, a certain amount is going to ESL? Yes, let me. Let's hold. So 15 is for ESL and then uh, the 26 plus the five is for programming. Um, uh, the, so it's $23,000 for programming altogether. Not altogether. 18, 18. Please hold. So that's the eight, eight that Bob mentioned. 15 and 23, yes. 10? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, 2,800 for youth, 1,800 uh, YA, 1,800 adult, 800 at North, 800 at Munson, and, just, and another 500 for ESL is what's projected. Okay, thank you. Um, I do have confidence in the staff that they will do the best they can to provide programming. And um, I do understand that there's so many unknowns that you have to lose some amounts um, for contingency. Thank you. Uh, Lee Edwards. Bob, uh, hold on one second, Lee. Bob, is your hand, is that a new hand or an old hand? <laughs> I have one more comment, but okay. I can wait. Okay, then fine. Lee? Uh, this is a, a question to Sharon first. Um, my, my sense is that a lot of programming goes on that's already kind of built into the library's budget in terms of staff time and what and minimal materials needed. Uh, is that assumption correct? Absolutely. Okay. Yes, there's money. So that the comes... fact, all right. So the fact that there's not a whole lot of extra money, it, it's in part because the staff already has programming built into what their job description is, as it were. Is that right? And and, and or free. Yeah. Oh, uh, oh, okay. And then my other comment is, insofar as the friends and the capital campaign. Uh, are involved in programming uh, on behalf of the library. Any expenses that are incurred as part of that programming is borne by the Friends and the Capital Campaign Committee, uh, which put out a big event and has other events in mind as part of what the Friends and the the fundraising committee in general sees as its obligation, especially in this 
interval. So it's not that there won't be programming. Uh, it just won't be the usual kind of library programming. Thank you. Okay, uh, uh, Gene, Bob, and then back to you, Gene. Just wanted to add on, I think uh, all the viewpoints expressed right now are by everyone, there's there's validity to all of that. Um, just a, is it a suggestion or a possibility that we could formally kind of reconvene after the move, after the echoes of the move um, have settled down and the staff are in all the interim spaces? I think there's more than one. Um, at that point, you know, once, you know, whether that's June, July, or August, uh, is there a possibility for for Sharon and the staff to come back and say, well, now that we're in and we see what this looks like, this is what we might suggest for, say, the second half of, of the fiscal year. Just kind of like saying, like, you know, don't want to say, you know, no to Bob, but maybe let's get past that period of uncertainty that's going to be caused by the move, because goodness gracious knows what's going to happen, right, during the move. There's so many moving pieces my mind explodes when I actually have looked at some of the lists. Um, is there a way to to kind of formally revisit this or commit to revisit this at some period of time after the move is completed? Bob? The answer is, of course, we could meet at any time if there was a desire to do so. I would note that this year we knew months ago that we were not going to reach $175,000 and we simply went into a different pot of money to replace that. The same was true in the previous year. The, the, the director has not come to the board and said, whoops, the budget is out of balance. This is what I'm going to do to fix that. Um, and you know, I don't believe that that's going to happen next year either. So um, that is the first point. And the second is that while I, understand and appreciate what Tammy has said and Farah has said and Sharon has said about protecting the staff. Um, what, what we're describing is an inward looking library uh, when I think for the next two years, what we need to be doing is be an outward looking library and focused on how we look and how we act and how we respond to the town. And if we don't do that, I, I don't know how well we will be able to do on raising the money that we need to raise. So thank you, Bob. Sharon, I have a couple of questions, if it's OK. Uh, could you give us a sense? Let's just imagine forward it's the fall. Let's think, of, Bob, I'm going to, if you allow me to kind of assume that the programming that we did last year or two years ago was adequate, though I know you're not sure that it was. What kinds of programs would have been done last year or the year before in September and October, November, that will not be done under the proposed budget for this upcoming year? Could you give, I... us, could you give us a little bit of a sense of kind of what we're talking about? So no, I can't. Um, because going back to the fact that we are so in flux, what's, what's been happening for the past, let's say, year and a half, is the staff are going to the friends kind of piecemeal. That's not yeah. what the way we've been doing it, you know, for the past 10 years. Um, and, and of course, and the friends wish we the staff could come to them and say, hey, this is what our entire fiscal year is going to look like. They just can't. So it's easier for staff to go month by month by month, which is why I've got a Woodbury request vote for you guys to look at uh, this month, just like you had one last month and the month before. It's it's all about when it's all about staff uh, schedules and the way things are going and what's going on in town. I absolutely disagree completely that there hasn't been enough programming. It's one of the reasons that I put but all I, of the. I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I really, I, but I, I was trying to just get a, a sense of if we looked at the calendar of things that was done in the library last September or the September before that or some other September, what would we see that is likely to be 
not able to be done this upcoming September? In other words, we're, is there any way to make it a little more concrete about what we're talking about? Right now, I only know that the summer reading program is going to be uh, pared down quite a bit. And that's where a lot of the money normally goes to. And so, again, so staff aren't looking into the fall. So I, I just can't answer your question. I don't know. Well, um, you're contemplating doing less programming. Is that correct? I'm contemplating putting less money towards it. Doesn't mean that there's going to be less programming. My question is, are you contemplating doing less programming? It's very hard to follow this because on the one hand, you seem to be saying we're going to be doing less programming because of the demand on the staff. Is that correct? That's what I'm just trying to figure out. Yes, that's absolutely correct. So but what I know about the staff is when they have the time and the motivation and they see a program, oh, yes, this will fit here then they're going to go for it and they will ask the friends for the funding. So would it affect your the operation of the library if we increase the programming budget and then you either used it or you didn't as you saw things unfold? Yeah, absolutely. So rather than wait and then mid-year and adjust this and that, I mean, the question of what programming we have in the library is a question for you and the staff to decide, right? The trustees don't vote on we, we should have this program or that program. <clears throat> but if it's a matter of providing resources in the eventuality that a staff person comes forward and says, you know, I've got time, I'd like a thousand dollars to do this. A, a budget is a planning document, but it isn't a set of commands. So uh, would you have any objection? Totally fine. Provide the funds. You use them as you're able to use them. Now, the question is whether or not we can produce a balanced budget in um, by allocating more, more funds for programming. So again, just so I'll understand this, Bob made a proposal that we uh, increase, Bob, where is this $25,000 going to come from? I propose that that the expectation to come from the friends uh, be increased by $25,000. That still makes it about a third less than we put into the budget this year. Yep. It makes it roughly equivalent to what we expect to raise this year. I don't understand the question. I, you know, I don't understand the opposition. <laughs> well, I wasn't asking whether you understood the opposition. I was just asking where you where you were proposing that the money come from. That was my proposal. Correct. And uh, of course, another place the money could come from is we could increase incrementally the draw from the endowment. We could. So <clears throat> it is not clear to me at this moment uh, whether. Um, the allowance which is built into the building construction budget, which says this is the amount for moving and for temporary spaces, includes the cost of utilities in those spaces. No, we have to pay our utilities. So it seems, I mean, my own... My own disposition is um, I, I don't share exactly Bob's sense that, you know, the future of the library depends upon the programming that we do over the next year. I, I don't. Uh, I think that people rightly will understand uh, the situation of the library. I think they are looking forward to the renovated and expanded library. Uh, so I don't I don't have that sense. Um, if if the fundraising people, if Lee came said, no, you got to do this or otherwise we're not going to be able to raise money. Then I would I would think, OK, it's necessary for the capital campaign, but I haven't heard that. But what I've heard is Sharon saying. 
she doesn't want to she doesn't want to lead people to have a set of false expectations about the amount of programming that can be done. And that message, I think, has been very clear. But why not provide Sharon budget this and with the understanding that uh, it will be up to Sharon and the staff to figure out if they can use the funds and how they can use the funds. Sharon, would that work for you? Sure, yep. Yep, Farah. Just a comment that I, I don't think there's anything inward looking about what some of us have said, Bob. I, I don't believe just like Austin just said, I don't think the community is going to expect us to to provide programming on the level that we have been providing based on the space. But I also don't think it's inward looking to be considerate of what the staff's uh, constraints are going to be. And, and I really appreciate the fact that Sharon isn't trying to, I, I don't even know if it's like live beyond her means or like not meet expectations. I just wanted to comment about that. I don't think there's anything inward looking about that to be to to ensure that people can <clears throat> provide what they can provide and not if they can't provide what you're expecting them to provide. I think I don't <clears throat> I think I'm going roundabout on this. I just want to say, I don't think there's anything in we're looking about this. And I think it's really important to trust what Sharon and the staff think they are able to provide in the interim space. And I liked Eugene's suggestion of looking at this somewhere down the road, but I'm also okay with Austin's suggestion right now. Thanks. I may be mishearing. I thought I heard the library director said the, that adding $25,000 to the programming budget so long as it's understood that that line might be dramatically underspent, it's fine with her. And from a, a budgeting point of view, why, why assume we're gonna now meet in six months and then have to come up with more money to, to do this? Why not say, hip, we'll put in $25,000 more into the programming budget, but everybody needs to understand that it's not a mandate. It's a set of resources. Any, anybody else want to say anything about the this okay. question? And then I'm going to ask Bob if he wants to make his motion to make his motion. Okay, I will. Just note that during the month of February, the amount of gifts to the capital campaign was $2,500 um, as compared to the previous month of 8,000, which is, and the previous month before that, which was 30,000. You know, it's, it is the, the amount that we have gotten in this last month has been pitiful. The amount that was given to the capital campaign was one thousand two hundred dollars. I'm, you know, I think if we are ignoring those kinds of signals, I think we are going to be doing the wrong thing. But I will make my motion. Um, I do not expect that 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 we will simply put fake dollars into a fake budget and ignore it when when it comes to actual activity. This is a plan of action. That's what a budget's about. So my recommendation, my motion is uh, to add $25,000 to the programming line to be balanced by an increase in the gifts and grants line of $25,000 and the grand total to be therefore raised by $25,000. Is there a second to Bob's motion? Well, I'm going to second it. I, I second Bob's motion. And Bob, I was I was kind of almost with you until you 
until <laughs> you argued for your motion. Uh, I'm not talking about fake dollars. I don't think what the capital campaign has done is pitiful. Neither do I. Well, I need you to listen now. Just, just for a minute, if it's okay. Sure. Well, that was the word you used. You said last month total was pitiful. I don't regard it as pitiful. I regard it as part of a process. But in, in any case, I thought we had a solution to this, but I don't think it's fake to offer resources for this and to say to the director, you do what you can with these resources. Budgets are overspent in some lines, underspent in other lines. Uh, and I certainly wouldn't want it understood that if we were to increase the budget line for programming, that we are mandating the director to run programs. What we're doing is we're authorizing her to do it. And we're saying, here are resources if you can do it. Lee? Um, I will vote in favor of the motion. And I thank the president of the board of trustees for his Solomonic wisdom. Okay. Other, other comments about budget. Now, we're, right, we're, we're voting to increase budget line for programming, and then we've got to vote on the budget. So this is just to change the budget line for programming and the revenue source that Bob has identified. Anything else want said on that? Okay. So on the question of increasing the budget line for programming, Lee Edwards. Aye. Farah? Yes. Tammy? No. Jean? Yes. Bob? Yes. And Austin votes yes. So now we come back to the budget. Is there anything else that anybody wants to say about the budget? Okay. So the motion is to approve the budget proposal for FY25. As amended. As amended, yep. Okay, Bob, on that motion? Yes. Farah? Yes. Lee? Yes. Tammy? Yes. Jean? Yes. And Austin votes yes. Okay. And with thanks to Sharon and the staff for putting together the budget proposal, a lot of work goes into the budget proposal. Uh, I think we can feel good about this budget proposal. Budgeting for the library is done, I think, in a, in a really good way. Okay, next is investment. Bob. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the last meeting, we approved the transfer from uh, Vanguard's uh, outside advisory service to Mercer's advisory service, which uh, is comprised of exactly the same staff, um, essentially providing much the same services to the extent that we can tell. Um, what we've received at our most recent meeting was um, a report prepared while it was still a Vanguard entity. Um, they have not yet shown us what a Mercer version would look like. Um, they assure us that it will look much the same. But that is where that stands at this moment. Um, with respect to our uh, financial situation, the endowment as of February 29th was $8,964,513.51. Yep. 
the Woodbury Fund as of February 29th was $735,169.87. That, <clears throat> that is a substantial increase over where it was a, a year ago. And um, obviously, it is nice to know that, that we are doing what the market does. Um, this is not uh, something which we can use in terms of determining the endowment draw because that is based upon quarter ends. And so March 31st will be the critical number um, as, it, as uh, our June 30th and September 30th and December 31st. But uh, based upon what uh, we have as of last June, uh, the endowment draw will be 354619 which is, I suppose, really part of the budget report. Uh, but that is where that stands. Uh, I am still not entirely clear on uh, the access to the new Mercer reports, and so I will have to be working with Dan Voss on doing that, and I assume, Austin, you will need to have your own access again for yep. that. Yep. Um, and I have told uh, our consultant, our advisor on this, that it is unlikely that by the uh, end of this coming quarter by June 30th that I will still be on this board because um, I am at this point planning to move on or about June 14th. So um, it is time for this board to start to consider who uh, uh, of the existing board members uh, might be interested in serving on the investment committee. Um, maybe by attending some of the sessions that we will hold as we do this transition. Uh, <clears throat> and in addition, to think about uh, the kind of people that we might hope to join the board to replace me, uh, hopefully with the same interest in budgets and investments uh, that, that I have. And we should probably consider the possibility of having a non-board member sit uh, on a committee with us on these committees uh, if we found, found that useful. Thanks, Bob. Um, Bob, do you yet know, uh, I mean, is your plan to move on June 14th, is that, a, is that kind of concrete that's gonna happen? Assuming that the inspector uh, who is looking at my house at this time, at this moment, uh, does not find something radically wrong, uh, we have scheduled uh, us to vacate our house by June 14th. The reason that I ask is um, there's a process that we have to go through to replace you. Correct. It's dependent upon your informing the town, your informing us and informing the town that you will be resigning from the board. Mm -hmm. um, you should, of course, make that determination whenever you are ready to make that determination. But I think that uh, as soon as you make that determination, if you could let the town let us know so that the process can go forward of replacing you, which involves a process uh, through the town council. Mm -hmm. uh, because until that is done, it'll be hard for us to figure out our response to what you just said, who, who from the current board, who might be coming onto the, onto the board. I do wanna say what I've said in the investment committee um, Bob's uh, resignation from the board, when that does occur, uh, will end a term of really distinguished service to the town and to the board. 
Uh, Bob has been an enormously important member of the board uh, and a real steward of our finances for which we are all incredibly, uh, incredibly grateful. And he will be incredibly hard to replace both in his expertise and his commitment to the library. Uh, any questions about investments? Okay, thanks, Bob. Next item is uh, a report from the Friends of the Jones Library System. Is Richard Morse going to make that report? Wow. Okay, nice to see you. Thanks Can you hear me? Coming. Yes. Well, um, I volunteered for this. A uh, job um, knowing that um, nobody replaces Lou Manger. Correct. So um, I'll do my best. Um, there are only a couple of things I want to point out. One is that uh, the friends have had rather extensive discussions about the future of the organization. We had a brainstorming session for an hour and a half in the Woodbury room last Monday. So there are these ongoing discussions going on. I, I can't really, we haven't made any big decisions, but the the conversation is occurring. The other thing I think that's important to point out today is that there has been expressed in a couple of meetings now, a strong desire for there to be some kind of ongoing contact or interaction between the trustees and the members of the Friends Executive Board. Um, and how we sort of regularize that um, I think is yet to be determined, or, um, but we essentially, um, we've suggested a, a sort of a social event, maybe an annual social event where we get together, the trustees and the friends get together. Uh, the other possibility is that maybe um, um, a trustee would come with Lee, because Lee regularly attends, but another trustee would come so that maybe we could see each one of you maybe at least once a year in a, in a friend's meeting. Um, but I actually, it struck me as I've been sitting here listening to the conversation today that um, I guess I'm even further enlightened that there needs to be more uh, conversation between trustees and, and friends. So I just want to bring that up and that that's all that I have, re have to report uh, this month. Thanks. Thank you, Rich. Sharon, didn't we get, didn't we have an annual prior to before COVID? Didn't we have some annual joint meeting? Yeah, yeah, before COVID, and then and then we haven't gone back to that. We've kind of all just been involved in the building project. Yeah, no, we. Um, I remember we did those meetings. And they were great. It was wonderful. So you work with the friends and come up with a proposal for how to resume uh, uh, an even closer collaboration so that um, we can meet with uh, the friends in whatever way they and we find most most appropriate. But yeah, I remember those, those, those meetings. Okay, any other questions about the friends? We're grateful. Rich, for the work that you do, we're grateful for the friends, the work that the friends do, and we'll be eager to hear your the results of your deliberations about the future of the organization. But thanks, Thank and gratitude, Thank please. You. Thank you. Director's report. Uh, during the last uh, friends meeting, uh, the, no, the friends meeting on February 24th, they approved that uh, $500 be withdrawn from Woodbury for adult programming. And so now I would like you all to approve that as well. Okay, would someone please make a motion? So moved, I move $500 from the Woodbury Fund for adult programming. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Second. Good, thanks for the second. Okay, any discussion? Voting to approve, Bob? Sure, 500 is fine. Far? Yes. Gene? Yes. Lee? Yes. Tammy? Yes. And Austin votes yes. Sharon? That's it, That's that's all from me. 
Okay. I had one last thing, if I could. Sure, Bob. Um, in the 990, which we have to file each year with the federal government, um, we answer certain questions. Um, and the answers are, do we have a written conflict of interest policy? And the answer is no. Do we have a whistleblower policy? And the answer is no. Do we have a retention and destruction policy? And the answer was no. Um, I think perhaps PPP should take a look at those questions. Uh, the question of should we have a whistleblower policy? Should we have a, what were the other two? Conflict of interest and retention and destruction. Good. Yeah, makes a lot of makes a lot of sense. Tammy, if you would add that to the agenda, that would be great. Okay, nice seeing you all. Stay well, everybody, and we'll look forward to seeing you at our next meeting. We're adjourned. Bye. Okay.